Good evening, everybody, and welcome to an evening with Judy Chicago. This is a really exciting night for us. This event is sponsored by the West Michigan Women's Studies Council, which is a consortium of area colleges, including Aquinas College, Calvin College, Davenport University, Grand Rapids Community College, Grand Valley State University, and Hope College, as well as our community partner, the Grand Rapids Public Library. Before going further, may I ask the West Michigan Women's Studies Council board members to rise and be acknowledged. This lecture series is generously funded by the Nokomis Foundation. Since 2002, the Nokomis Foundation has made it possible for the West Michigan Women's Studies Council to bring two nationally and internationally prominent lecturers to Grand Rapids every year, including such transformational women as Molly Ivins, Barbara Ehrenreich, Wendy Wasserstein, Mira Nyer, Bell Hooks, Elaine Pagels, Martha Burke, Vanda Nashiva, and others too numerous to mention here. We are deeply grateful to the Nokomis Foundation for their continued support. Without their dedication to feminist causes, we would not have heard the voices of these speakers who have changed so many lives for the better. Tonight's lecture will be the last offering for a while, so we are particularly honored that Judy Chicago, another transformational feminist, is joining us tonight. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions and answers, followed by a reception in the wave room on the second floor. There will also be postcards of Judy Chicago's work available for purchase in the wave room. May I ask, um, if you haven't already done so, uh, to please turn off your cell phones so that you can enjoy the presentation. Um, also, um, we would appreciate that you don't take photographs, no photos, and no texting, please. Um, I'm also, <laughs> it's a generational thing. Um, if you, um, I'm told that if, uh, uh, we, we don't have books here tonight, but, if you buy a book from Judy Chicago's website, uh, she will autograph the book for you before it is sent to you. Judy Chicago is an artist, author, feminist, educator, and intellectual. She has said, I am trying to make art that relates to the deepest, and most mythic concerns of humankind. And I believe that at this moment in history, feminism is humanism. Judy Chicago is a pioneer in feminist art education. In the early 1970s, she created a unique feminist art program for women at California State University at Fresno. Later at Cal Arts, she and her students produced the groundbreaking Woman House Project. In 1974, with her multimedia monumental project, The Dinner Party, Chicago turned her attention to the subject of women's history in Western civilization. She wrote, it is important to note that The Dinner Party is built on a solid foundation of research into history, art history, feminism, and the obstacles women faced and continue to face as they struggled to participate fully in the societies in which they lived. She also observed, because we are denied knowledge of our history, we are deprived of standing upon each other's shoulders and building upon each other's hard-earned accomplishments. Instead, we are condemned to repeat what others have done before us and thus we continually reinvent the wheel. The goal of the dinner party is to break this cycle. The dinner party, which has become an icon of feminist art, has been seen by more than one million viewers in exhibitions spanning six countries, 
and is now permanently housed at the Brooklyn Museum as the centerpiece of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Chicago's commitment to the power of art as an instrument for transforming society can be seen in other projects too, including the Birth Project, completed after Chicago observed a lack of iconography about the subject of birth in Western art. Power Play, a series that brings a critical feminist gaze to definitions of power. The Holocaust Project, From Darkness into Light, which explores issues of power and powerlessness, as well as Chicago's interest in her Jewish heritage. Resolutions, A Stitch in Time, which combines painting and needlework in images that playfully reinterpret traditional adages and proverbs. And her most uh, recent exploration of forms and meaning in her series of cast, fused, etched, and painted glass. Chicago's abundant production as an artist is accompanied by an equally abundant life as an author. Among her many and varied texts are Through the Flower, My Struggle as a Woman Artist, Beyond the Flower, The Autobiography of a Feminist Artist, Women and Art, Contested Territories, Kitty City, A Feline Book of Hours, the Dinner Party, From Creation to Preservation, and recently, Face to Face, Frida Kahlo. Judy Chicago's legacy as an artist is intrinsically connected to her pioneering role in feminist art and education. More than 30 years ago, she founded the nonprofit feminist art organization Through the Flower as a resource for scholars and students around the world. On throughtheflower.org, information can be found about Chicago's K-12 dinner party curriculum project, a cohesive curriculum that continues to bring knowledge about women's achievements to generations of students. As a feminist, humanist, educator, artist, and author, Judy Chicago is a transformative leader and pioneer for social change. Therefore, please join me now in welcoming her to this stage for an evening with Judy Chicago. Good evening. I'm just checking where the water is. I have to say that this theater qualifies as the most bizarre place I've ever spoken. <laughs> the only other situation I've ever been in like this is when I spoke at the Getty Museum at a conference and they had this gigantic screen where they projected your face when you were speaking, which was very disconcerting because you kept looking and thinking, do I look fat? Do I look old? I mean, but to be in a multiplex, I have to say, is pretty close to the Getty experience. Also equally bizarre is what happened to the books that were supposed to arrive for the book signing. The executive director of Through the Flower called me up today and told me that the box had arrived as sent, but it arrived, but because of the holiday weekend, nobody opened it. And when they opened it today, inside were all the packing materials. It was sealed, but there were no books in it. Somebody had carefully opened the package removed the books, and resealed the box. Now, I have to say that having books stolen between Albuquerque and Grand Rapids is another bizarre experience. <laughs> I don't know if there was some, like, I don't know, secret feminist in the post office. At any rate, 
If you want to buy signed books, actually, you should go on the website of Through the Flower. It's throughtheflower.org, through, T-H-R-O-U-G-H. No, like, uh, tweet spelling. Okay, when I was being interviewed for um, the paper, the reporter asked, started the interview by saying, how on earth are you going to cover your entire career in one lecture? Which I thought was really funny, and I got a kick out of it. And I said to her, well, you know, I used to try. And in fact, somebody from the Women's Council, Studies Council, was telling me that she had heard a lecture I delivered in the 1990s that went way over the time because I was trying to cover my whole career. So now that my career is even longer than that, what I now do is I give you glimpses into different series, and that's what I'm going to do tonight. So these works I did in the first decade of my um, career, in the 1960s when I was, oh, let me ask a question. Is there anybody in the audience who knows nothing about my work? If, if, if that's so, okay, so let me just give you a little background, okay? I grew up in Chicago, and I left when I was 17 and to go to college at UCLA in Los Angeles, and the only thing I took with me was my Chicago accent, which is how I started being called Judy Chicago. And through a whole series of events, which you can read about in Beyond the Flower, if the, one of the books that was supposed to get here and mysteriously disappeared. Um, I changed my name in the early 1970s. But from the time I was a child, I started drawing when I was three, and I started going to the Art Institute when I was five. And I, the only thing I ever wanted to do in my life was be an artist. So by the time I got to UCLA, and I got my bachelor's and my master's in both painting and sculpture. And throughout my career, I've gone back and forth from two to three dimension. So in the first decade of my career, I did both large-scale sculpture and large-scale paintings. The image on the left is called Rainbow Pickett. It's named after a soul singer named Wilson Pickett, who was very popular in the 1960s. P-I-C-K-E-T-T, -T. and the image on the right is an eight foot by eight foot sprayed painting on sheet plexiglass. It's called Flesh Garden, and uh, it's actually called Sky Flesh from the, sex, uh, from the Flesh Garden series. And in the first decade of my career, I did mostly minimal work. Uh, at that time, in the LA art scene, it, which was very macho, it was very difficult to be a woman artist. It was very popular to be told you can't be a woman and an artist too, and it was almost impossible to openly express oneself as a woman and be taken seriously as an artist. So for the first decade of my career, I tried to fit in. But after a, 10 years, I got fed up and decided I wanted to be myself. Could I have the next? <coughs> on the left is a five foot by five foot painting, sprayed acrylic on canvas called Through the Flower, which became the title of my first autobiographical book and also the name of the nonprofit arts organization I started 30 years ago. Um, it, the painting is about trying to push through the petals of femininity into a larger, freer space. In a few years after I did Through the Flower, I did a series of drawings, Prismacolor, on... I didn't do it. <laughs> Prismacolor on paper called the Rejection Quintet. This is the center drawing from the Rejection Quintet. And the question that I asked is, how does it feel to, ha to reveal yourself and be rejected? Because this is about peeling back the kind of formalist structure that I had developed in my work in order to reveal a female core. 
actually, it's a very funny story. When the rejection quintet. <laughs> is that from the feedback from the mic for the um, taping? I feel like the mic is going to bite me. <laughs> you guys can hear me without, without my speaking directly into the mic, right? Because I have another kind of, I have this, I have this mic on. Um, when the Rejection Quintet was first exhibited, it was bought by uh, somebody who attempted to give it to the Art Institute of Chicago, and they rejected it. Donald, are you there? Oh, I'm going to have to talk some more about these because uh, my husband, Donald Woodman, the photographer, has the clicker because he's changing the images. But now he's trying to solve the, the mic problem. Let's see. Um, how many of you have had art history courses? A lot of you. How many of you know how to read visual imagery? Okay, is there anybody who looks at these images and can't understand them or can't relate to them or can't see what I'm telling you about them? I, I need the, okay. Uh, are you gonna do, deal with the mic? Yeah, where's the other mic? Maybe it's you, Donald. Who, ha who has the handheld? Oh. Where's the handheld mic? You're the culprit. It's off. It's off? Huh? It's off? So it's not that? I'm not talking in there. This is the this is the film. I know, I know, I'm on the lavalier. Okay, honey, can I have the next image? This one or the one after this? This one. <laughs> I'm not gonna get near that. Huh? You're going to unplug it? You're going to use the handheld. Oh, I'm going to use the hand. Oh, okay, fine. After we went in the bathroom and took the whole, put Just the, on. Just put the whole lavalier down my shirt. <laughs> we started out doing it in the wave room, but then people came up there thinking that was where the lecture was. Let and me, it was, let me go switch. it was very, Hang on. I gotta go up that's not there. on. And it was a little embarrassing having Donald standing there putting the lavalier down my shirt. <laughs> I kept saying, but he's my husband, it's all right. <laughs> okay, wait a second, he's going to go turn this on, okay? You probably can't hear me way in the back, can you, if I talk without the mic? No, probably not. Okay, so we'll just take a looking break. <laughs> we'll all look at the images. No, Donald said he took, no, mm -mm. It, it has to be, no, mm -mm. Mm -mm. no, it has to be done from up there, I think, otherwise he wouldn't have gone running up and down the steps. You know, we're not getting any younger, there it is, okay. <laughs> Let's see, what did one of the organizers say, I'm very, fortunate to be married to a techie, in addition to being a wonderful photographer and a great husband. Okay, so what happened in the intervening years uh, went between the time I showed you through the flower and peeling back was that I began to look at women's history. When I was a student at UCLA, I took a um, class in, well that didn't help, Projectors. One, they just completely had independent lives. One went forward, one went backwards. 
It was like, it drove me crazy. I was cursing on stage. And later, a lot of these art teachers came up to me and said, I totally understand how you felt because our AV systems always screw up. Anyway, when I was a student, thank you, John. Huh? Yeah, okay. It's a mystery, like the lost, like the books. You think it's Grand Rapids? Is there some history? A mystery in Grand Rapids? Okay. When I was a, when I was a student at UCLA, I took a course in the intellectual history of Europe, taught by a very highly respected historian. At the first class, he said that he was going to talk about women's contributions in the last session. I waited all semester because I was a very ambitious young woman. I wanted to be part of art history. I wanted to know what women before me had done. At the last class, he came in, he walked across the stage, and he said, women's contributions, they made none. That was the prevailing view of the time when I was in school. So about 10 years after I started my professional career, I was very confused by the many obstacles I was encountering, and I decided to look back to see if my professor was right, whether there had been any women before me who had faced similar obstacles, and if so, what they had done. So this was before there were any women's studies courses. I began a self-guided tour, research tour, into women's history. And I discovered that my professor was, not, was completely wrong, that women had a rich history that was unknown, and it made me really mad. So I began to try and express what I was discovering in my art with a series of paintings called The Great Ladies, in which I made images of famous women in history who I admired or how, who I learned something from. Or... This is bizarre. To huh? Okay. Trying to deal with two mics at one time. Is that what it is? It's yeah. just no matter what the mics are? Yeah, just speak, try. speak huh? in this direction. Okay. So um, <clears throat> the painting on the left, which is actually a rather small painting, 40 inches by 40 inches, which is sprayed acrylic on um, unprimed canvas, except for underneath the images where they're j there's gesso, is called The Transformation of the Great Ladies. At this point, I began to feel dissatisfied with sprayed acrylic and began and wanted to find a different medium through which to tell women's history. Because I had this idea for, to do a big project in which I would tell women's history through a series of abstract images. At that time, I, quite by accident, I saw a, a china painted plate. Do you all know what china painting is? It's painting on porcelain, multi-fired on top of porcelain. It originally started in the East, in China, in Asia, and was brought over by Marco Polo, became very popular in Europe, was brought over to America at the end of the 19th century, and through a series of strange coincidences, went entirely into women's hands. Between the First and Second World Wars, women kept china painting alive. So in order to learn china painting, I apprenticed myself to this world of women. It was completely different from what I had grown up with in terms of art school and uh, also in my early days as a young artist when I got out of graduate school, for example, I went to auto body school to learn to spray paint. Me and 250 guys. They made me wear this long white overcoat so that if I happened to lean over, one of my breasts would not be exposed because we know that those guys, having never seen breasts, would have just fallen over dead on the ground at the sight of a titty. So it was quite different to be in this environment 
seated around the kitchen table with women who would talk about their personal problems while they painted. And then they'd say, oh no dear, that color's no good. You really need to use this color. It took me two years to learn how to china paint. Originally, I was gonna do 100 plates and hang them on the wall. Each one would be named after uh, a, a single woman because after all, paintings belong on the wall. This, the image on the top and the right is a 14 inch china painted plate fired 14 times and it's untitled. I originally was going to name it after an Amazon queen, but my ideas evolved. Could I have the next? Um, is anybody here who doesn't know what the dinner party is? How great. I can't tell you how it feels when I have to start from the beginning and say the dinner party is a symbolic history of women in Western civilization, or as I often say, a reinterpretation of the Last Supper from the point of view of those who've done the cooking throughout history. <laughs> this is the dinner party in its permanent installation at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, uh, where it has finally come to rest after a long and arduous journey around the world. It is in a specially built room with glass walls. The dinner party is 48 feet on a side and it is a virtual walk through Western civilization, except instead of the various periods of Western civilization being represented by male heroes, they are represented by various female figures, goddesses, and women. The dinner party is introduced by a series of woven banners that carry phrases from a poem that talks about how equality and justice will come to the world only when we are all equal and there is justice on earth for everyone, which is what I believe the goal of feminism is. Could I have the next? Here are some views from the dinner party table. This is the first wing. Each woman or goddess or historical figure is represented on a plate. The plate rests on an elaborately needleworked runner, which drops, uh-uh. <laughs> Thank you. Which drops over the table in the front and the back. On the front is a uh, illuminated capital letter at the front of each woman's name. And the motifs of both the plate and the runner reflect something about the woman, her life. For example, Sappho, the Greek lyric poet, was known as the flower of the graces and her colors were lavender and green, hence the plate is a flower image. Her uh, capital letter has a lyre in wound around the S to refer to the gymnasium where she had students and women gather to play music and read poetry. Um, above is the third wing of the table and as you walk around the table the plates begin to rise up as a metaphor for the struggle of, for liberation that one sees in the history of women and as you see, there is Sojourner Truth, who was one of the first people to actually link uh, gender and race oppression. Her plate reflects three African masks. Her, the, her runner is a peace quilt. Include, it refers to the piecing that African American slaves often did for the quilts that they made, and also the fact that they pieced in scraps of African fabric as a way of commemorating their own heritage. Next to her is Susan B. Anthony. When I was uh, a student, Susan B. Anthony was a footnote in history, which when I really began to study women's history and discovered how she had changed the face of the nation, really got me furious. I mean, I'm like, 
who's what's his name in his midnight ride, Paul Revere, right. What's like, what is that compared to having worked for 50 years and changed the entire condition of women in not only America, but all over the Western world. In fact, in 1893 at the Women's Building it, at the Chicago World's Fair, which Susan B. Anthony was instrumental in having built, wherever she appeared, any auditorium, and the auditoriums were filled with tens of thousands of people, everybody would rise to their feet and applaud her. And within decades, she had been reduced to a footnote in the history books. That's the story of erasure that the dinner party is intended to counter and also to express. As you walk around the table, on the backs of the runners, which are difficult to see, there are other stories about the women's lives. One of the reasons the backs of the runners are difficult to see is because it is difficult to see through the prevailing paradigm of history to the richness of women's heritage. Grouped on the heritage floor, 2,300 hand-cast porcelain tiles, are the names of 999 other women who made a significant mark on history. Their names are grouped around each place setting to represent the long history of achievement that the woman on the table represents. So for example, around Sojourner Truth uh, is the history, is our other uh, African-American women who struggled for freedom, who struggled against racism, who struggled for women's rights. Could I have the next? <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I created the dinner party between 1974 and 1979, and even though it's usual for an artist to beat <laughs> Sorry, I need to get the water. Um, to be done with the piece after she, you know, finishes creating it. In the case of the dinner party, I was not willing to let it go because of the historical information it embodies, also because from the beginning my goal was for it to be permanently housed, and that took 30 years. Uh, but while I was working on the dinner party, I became interested in the subject of birth, and I did an image for the back of the Mary Wollstonecraft runner depicting Mary dying from childbed fever two months after having given birth to her daughter Mary, who would become famous as Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. The image was quite graphic and raw, but when it was translated into needlework, I realized that if I wanted to deal with the subject of birth, I should do it through needlework. Although I was still struggling to get the dinner party exhibited because uh, after its initial first huge success at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, it caused considerable controversy because of its insistence that women become central to our culture. And other museums refused to show it, and so I used to say the dinner party was the piece that everybody wanted to see and nobody wanted to show. Fortunately, grassroots groups developed all over America, Canada, and then around the world, and managed to bring the piece sometimes to their local museum, sometimes to alternative spaces through the flower, organized the tour. But it was very difficult for me to go on as an artist while also uh, maintaining a sense of connection and responsibility to and for the dinner party. Nevertheless, uh, I was fortunate that I had started Through the Flower because it became the sponsor and touring agent of the birth project. I worked with women needleworkers from all over the country who wrote me, hun I got hundreds of letters from people who wanted to work with me, to volunteer to work with me, which was a good thing, because I, was, I had lost everything as a result of doing the dinner party. And I had to start all over again. Over the course of the next five years, I created 80, 85 images of birth and creation. Uh, the cover of the book you see uh, that chronicles the process and above that is a 14-foot tapestry woven by my longtime collaborator, Audrey Cowan. It's called The Creation, and it challenges the idea 
that creation took place by a male god reaching out his finger and creating man, which sort of turns reality on its head and always aggravated me. <laughs> so my idea is if you don't like something, make an alternative. Could I have the next? Here are two exa other examples of birth project work. On the upper right, a small embroidery, embroidered directly over my drawing by Jane Gady Thompson. It's silk thread on, on silk fabric. During the dinner party, that was the first time I ever designed for needlework. And one thing I discovered, to my surprise, is that I have an unaccountable ability to design for the needle and textile arts, even though I can neither sew or stitch. <laughs> um, but the birth project, I wanted to look at all different aspects of the birth experience, from the violent and painful to the mythic and glorious. Uh, also, the other thing I learned during the dinner party is that thread can be like a brush stroke. And what I mean by that is that thread can render the kind of painted fades you saw in my earlier work in a way that unites both color and surface and texture. In order to achieve those fades, Jane developed a system of working with multiple needles. Now, you probably don't really know how a fade like this would be done. Thread comes usually, let's say there's DMC floss. It comes in six strands. And what Jane would do is she would cut the strands in 18 inch lengths and then she'd strip them apart. And she would thread nine needles. So one needle would have three skeins of red, the next needle would have two skeins of red and a skein of dark pink. The next needle would have two skeins of dark pink and one skein of red, she would do that mathematically to get a blend. And then if it wasn't perfect, she'd come back over it with a single thread, just like I would with my paintbrush. The image on the bottom is a quilted painting called Earth Birth. It's sprayed acrylic on fabric, quilted along the painting uh, edges, and Jackie Moore Alexander, the quilter, changed the color of the thread in order to match my paint as she moved across the surface. And of course, this is an image of the female. The female is earth, the female giving forth light, the female giving forth life. Could I have the next? While I was still finishing the birth project, I began to have time to myself to begin to formulate other ideas because needlework is really slow. Also, a lot of needleworkers, actually what I learned when I was working in the birth project was I learned about ordinary women's lives. Because, you know, I have not lived the life of an ordinary woman. I've lived an unencumbered life. I have no children. I never wanted children. My work has been the focus of my life. And I was accustomed to working 10 or 12 hours a day. When I began to work with my needleworkers in the birth project, with whom I became closer, actually, than the people I worked with on the dinner party, probably because I would go around the country to look at the work because it was being done not in my studio but in their houses all over the country. So I entered into their lives and for a lot of them getting 10 hours a week for themselves was a big struggle. And thus I began to understand some of the obstacles to women's achievements. That is, not their talent but the many demands that are placed on women, the many expectations that are placed on women to put down their needles or their paintbrushes when the kids get sick, to put down their needles or their paintbrushes when the mother-in-law comes to town. And actually, that became part of the birth project in terms of documentation, 
But after a few years, I had all these pieces underway around the country. Actually, some of them, uh, there was a birth project show in, at the uh, museum in Traverse City. And in fact, they own a number of birth project works. So I had time, and by that time, I had gone to Europe again, and I had gone to Italy and seen the great Renaissance paintings. And I was very struck by the fact that in those paintings, in a way, they're the origin of our concept of the modern hero. And I wanted to look at the construct of masculinity. By that time, I'd been looking at the construct of femininity. And in the early 1980s, before there was something called gender studies, by then there was women's studies, but people assumed that only women had gender. When I went to the library to look up books on masculinity, research on masculinity, there was almost nothing. Just like there had been almost nothing, no, no women's studies courses, although there was a lot of information about women's history. At any rate, I started a series called Power Play, which is an examination of the construct of masculinity. And I did it in many ways like the Renaissance paintings in terms of scale. The painting on the top is nine feet by 14 feet. It's called Driving the World to Destruction. It's underpainted with acrylic. It's overpainted with oil. The painting, actually, I don't have to explain this the painting on the top to you. All you have to do is read the newspaper. <laughs> the painting on the bottom is called Three Faces of Man, and it examines the public and private faces of men. At some point, I began to think about the fact that one of the emotions men are really prohibited is vulnerability, at least in public. It's much more acceptable for men to have a jocular face or an angry face than to show weakness, tears, or emotion. I sometimes think that the G20 when they have their meetings, used to be the G8, now it's the G20, there's like one woman, it's almost all men. If they could all just sit around a table and start to cry and say, Jesus, we've made such a mess of the world, what should we do? It would be such a relief. But instead, they have a power headache. Oh my god, I have so much power. It gives me a headache. That's all right, dear, pass the Tylenol. I'll take some for a while. Take a vacation. On the top is a, a small painting, and then the painting translated into weaving by the same woman, Audrey Cowan, who wove the creation tapestry. Could I have the next? In 1984, while I was still working on power play and finishing the birth project, I had a sort of epiphany. I was raised in a secular Jewish family. I'm descended from 23 generations of rabbis on my father's side. But my father broke away, and as a result, I knew almost nothing about Jewish history. And I also knew almost nothing about the Holocaust. When I was growing up, the Holocaust was not discussed. It was not mandated in school. And still, my father was an avid student of history and of politics, and I still find it odd that no mention was made of the subject of the Holocaust. Now, maybe it was because I was looking at images of power and powerlessness Maybe I was looking at images of the, of the world, about the way the world is run, the way power is exercised, has been exercised by those men who've had power. But I suddenly became interested in the subject of the Holocaust. At that time, I also met Donald, who, like me, was raised in an assimilated Jewish family, knew nothing of Jewish history, and nothing of the Holocaust. We were from a similar generation. <clears throat> have, have any of you seen or heard of the film the, uh, by Cloud Lonsman, the nine-hour film called Shoah? In 1985, it was one of the first really big films 
exploring the subject of the Holocaust. And it was going to be shown in New York, and I wanted to go see it. And I told Donald about my interest, and so we went to New York together, and we sat in this theater over the weekend watching the two halves of the film. And it was an overwhelming experience for us in the sense that we were exposed to all this information we knew nothing about. And we were just like anybody else who first starts thinking about the Holocaust, how could it have happened? You know, how could the Jews just go to slaughter like lambs? How could people have done this? We were like that too at the beginning in 1985 when we started. But by 1993, when we finished the Holocaust Project from Darkness into Light, we didn't ask those questions anymore. Because by then, we had come to understand that the Holocaust grow, grew out of the world as it is structured today, which is what explains the ongoing genocide that we see all around us and calls into question, in a way, the, quest, the statement, never forget. Like, what do you mean? definitely the most daunting and difficult project I've ever undertaken. I don't think I could have done it except that Donald and I went on this journey together. So what we did was we created um, most of the Holocaust Project combines painting and photography, but it's introduced by a stained glass window, which takes the, everybody in Hitler's concentration camps were, fo were forced to wear, was forced to wear a different color triangle marking what they were arrested for. And I've turned those different color triangles upward and surrounded it with barbed wire and flames as a symbol of hope and transformation and the ability to overcome the worst that human beings can do. And the entryway piece into the Holocaust Project is this tapestry, 18 feet, also woven by Audrey Cowan called The Fall, which places the Holocaust in the context of Western civilization. Again, it's a narrative, a visual narrative, showing the sort of the way in which the Holocaust grew out of concepts that developed in, around the idea of reason, the Industrial Revolution, the assembly line, the idea of time is money, the first things on the assembly line, by the way, were pigs. And when we were in Auschwitz, which is like a big factory, I started wondering exactly what was the, where was the line in terms of the difference between processing pigs and processing people who were defined as pigs. And that was it. I was never able to eat factory f farm food again, process f food, process animals. It changed my whole life working on the Holocaust Project. Could I have the next? As I told you, most of the exhibition combines painting and photography. The Holocaust Project opened in 1993 and traveled as a whole exhibition for 10 years. The Birth Project also traveled to over 100 venues. The Holocaust Project traveled around the country and still travels in sections. Um, and here is a small painting that gives you an idea of the way we combine painting and needlework, I mean painting and photography. This is an image, a photograph that Donald, based on a photograph Donald took of an inn in the Alsace-Lorraine area of France, three kilometer, kilometers from a concentration camp called Knotsweiler. The, across from the inn, which was a, a hangout for the SS and the local populace, was a, a former bathhouse that was turned into a gas chamber. And this little small image is called Banality of Evil Strudhoff. It recreates what happened there. It compresses day and night. It's probable that the gas chamber was not used in broad daylight, but still, how could anybody not know what was going on if from nothing else but the smell? So the Holocaust Project is a journey into the darkness of the Holocaust and out into the light of hope. The last image in the Holocaust Project is a large stained glass window 
called Rainbow Shabbat that recasts the Friday night Jewish Sabbath service as an image of global healing and global sharing, what's known in Jewish culture as a tikkun alam. We decided to end the project with an image of hope. It's called Rainbow Shabbat, a vision for the future, because we came to believe that the only way never forget would mean anything and no future Holocaust would happen is if the world came together in a great global sharing and lifted up all these people in poverty who live in oppression and injustice. Only then will there be a future where people don't feel so desperate that they blow themselves up, turn themselves into human bombs. Could I have the next? Probably because I ended the Holocaust Project with an image of hope, and it was, it was about to be 2001, um, I'm mean 2000, the millennium, uh, I began to think about making some images, positive images for the future. So I worked from 1994 to 2000 with some of my longtime needle workers, the most skilled among them, and to do a, a, a series of images that combine painting and needlework to recast traditional proverbs for the future, for a global future. Also, to go farther with the process of combining painting and embroidery, painting and stitching that I had begun to do in the birth project. So, um, we started out, I and my needle workers, by meeting and discussing the basic values that are fundamental to a society. And so we made a sampler with those family, responsibility, conservation, tolerance, uh, human rights, hope, and change. Because without hope, we might as well just curl up and die. In fact, one time when Donald and I were working on the Holocaust Project, we heard a lecture by the Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel. And he was speaking at a, at a at a university in southern New Mexico. We live in New Mexico. We went down to hear him. There were 2,500 students. And a lot of the students in their questions expressed great despair and a great lack of hope that anything could be done about the world. And I'll never forget Elie Wiesel saying to them, how is it that I, who have faced the worst that human beings can do, am hopeful. And you, who have your whole lives before you, are so lacking in hope. Hope may be corny, but hope is essential. So, um, can I have the next? Uh, on the top, you see a painting called It's Always Darkest Before the Dawn. The left side is all in grays. And it's a picture of, it's, it's oil painting on canvas. And on the right side, the painting slowly becomes embroidered. It's a vision of a different world. And the embroidery brings that world to life. I'm often accused of hopeless naivety and ide over, being overly idealistic. And I'm like, really? Let's look at the picture of the world as I see it a hole in the ozone layer, pollution, rape, violence, the destruction of our, of our oceans, the destruction of our trees, uh, drug-addled cities, the destruction of animal life for profit. So if I make images of hope, it's because I choose hope, and so can you. The resolutions ends with a full-scale figure, a figure of indeterminate gender and race, uh, a wooden figure carved around the spiral of the figures, of the base of the figure in 22 languages. It says, find it in your heart. And then in the center heart and then around the spiral is this wonderful needlework technique called Japanese gold embroidery, which is usually done in tiny little spaces. <laughs> But this is the biggest piece of, longest piece of Japanese gold embroidery in history. Actually, this was amusing in terms of getting all these, this phrase, find it in your heart, translated. 
because we had to go all over the world to try and get translations. And what we wanted was a translation that expressed the idea, find it in your heart. And sometimes we got very literal translations, like one that came back in Chinese that was actually find it in your liver, <laughs> which wouldn't have worked at all. OK, can I have the next? So you saw the, that Rainbow Shabbat, the Rainbow Shabbat big 16-foot stained glass window that concluded the Holocaust project. That was the first time I ever worked in glass. But in the ensuing years, I was invited by someone I had met, actually, at the Indiana Women's Festival, who had a glass technique that she thought would lend itself to my images. And she asked me if I would work with her to translate some of my previous images, like through the flower and peeling back, into glass. And I was intrigued, and I started working with Vicki Leone. And after a while, I understood she had a technique that involved laminated, etched, and painted glass. Well, when I was studying china paint for the dinner party, a lot of the china painters also painted on glass. So I knew that you could paint and fire glass paints, these beautiful glass paints, on glass. But it was not something that people in the glass world knew. Do you all know what Pilchuck is in Washington? Pilchuck is a glass school that Dale Chihuly founded many years ago. But it centers mostly on glass blowing, which I wasn't interested in. I was interested in etching, casting. I was also interested in whether or not you could paint and fire glass paints on etch glass and cast glass. And I went to, to Pilchuck to find out. And within three weeks, I was somewhere that I have often been in my career, which was the outside edge of the technology. In other words, uh, my needleworkers used to say the reason that I could do these things in needlework was because I didn't stitch. And so I would imagine things that could be done using thread, and lo and behold, they were able to do it. Similarly, I was, because I didn't come from the glass world, I had an idea of what I wanted glass to do, because I choose particular techniques to express particular meaning, which is one of the things I think differentiates art from craft. That is that craft, by and large, um, focuses on the material and what the material will do, whereas art takes the material and bends it to the artist's intent and meaning, which is what I have been doing in glass. And I have found glass completely fascinating. Uh, this is an image called Temporal Connection, and it's four panels that are etched and multiply fire, painted and fired to be able to look through the simple gesture of holding hands to discuss issues of mortality, vulnerability, loss, and connection. Could I have the next? This is the last group of images I'm going to show you. Um, in order to cast these pieces, now y'all know y'all know what how bronze casting is done. Do you know what the lost wax process is, yeah. where you make a mold and then the bronze is poured into the mold? Well, it's similar in casting glass, except that number one, when you pour the bronze into the mold, basically the bronze cools and you break open the mold and there it is. When you pour the glass into the mold, it has to first melt, because they're billets, they're solid. It first it has to melt, and then it, so it has to go all the way to liquid, and then it has to come all the way back to solid. And that process is called annealing. And to anneal a piece as big as Flame Fist, which is roughly two feet high, took two months in the kiln. Otherwise, they break. So I've, and also, there are many bronze factories in America where artists can go, where they're used to doing uh, bronze casting for artists. 
That's not the same for glass casting. Mostly glass casters set up casting facilities for their production. So I've had to go to the Czech Republic and to Asia for casting my pieces. The piece on the top is called Extended Hand with Silver Fingernails. The piece, this piece is called Flame Fist. And these are from, my, the hands are from my first series, which I began in 2003 and I finished in 2007 or eight, and by which time I had started a new series of heads, which I started in 2007, and the first heads are just being shown right now. I'm having four glass shows this year, and the first heads are being shown at a show in Corpus Christi at the museum in Corpus Christi, where both Donald and I are having exhibitions and these are from a series called Toby Heads. On the left is called Two-Faced Toby, and this is called Toby Head with Golden Tear. This is cast glass, this is cast glass, gold leaf, and gilding. So um, now we can stop, and you can ask me questions, and we can have a little discussion. You can tell me what you think. Uh, I hope I've given you some sense of the range of my career, you can see more if you want to go on my website. And if you want to get the book, any of the books that got lost or other books, you go on through the Flowers website, throughtheflower.org, order from our online store, and I'll sign them for you. Okay, now for questions. If you want to ask me a question or you have a response, I need you to Stand up, introduce yourself, and wait for the mic to come to you so people can hear you. Who has the first question? My name is Tish Lewis. Um, I'm a student from Delta College. I read that you destroyed the rainbow picket, which was one of the first pieces that you showed. I wanted to know why. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Yes, I did uh, destroy rainbow picket. It's been reconstructed, thank God, but uh, what happened was, it was part of what happened during my first decade of uh, professional practice. I had a studio in Pasadena, California, which is just a little east of Los Angeles. Uh, you won't believe, it. what is that? I give up. <laughs> I surrender. <laughs> thank you. Um, you won't believe this, three artists, three of us had a 5,000 square foot studio for $75 a month total. Each of us paid $25 a month. See, things are really different now than they were then. I mean, now you come out of college with all this debt. I mean, when I was young, I had the luxury. It was really easy to live on sort of nothing. You know, I had the luxury of being able to, like, work full time in my studio. <laughs> It was very different than it is. Anyway, so I had this studio, and I was doing this large sculpture, and there was uh, this curator from the Passing Art Museum, the most powerful curator in Southern California. He used to go and visit all the artists in Pasadena because there were a lot of them there because it was cheap space. Artists are always attracted to cheap space. So um, I was the only woman artist in this whole group. So Walter came to my studio, and I had just finished Rainbow Picket, and he, like, refused to look at it, okay? He just wouldn't look at it. Broke my heart. Nevertheless, Rainbow Picket went to a big show in New York, the Jewish Museum, but I was so young and unsophisticated, I didn't know. You're supposed to get on an airplane and go to New York if you get in a big show, especially if you're one of the only three women in the show and it's gonna become a really historic show because it was the first major show of minimal art. But I was really dumb when I was young. 
That's what being young, young is. I mean, you just don't know. You just don't know. You don't understand. So I just, I mean, even though it attracted attention, I couldn't sell it. I had made all this big sculpture. I didn't know what to do with it. One of the things they don't tell you about in art school is art storage. So, you know, I destroyed a lot of that early work. Now, I put, I had enough sense to put some of it in storage, art storage, which I paid for years and years and years because I thought maybe there would be interest in my early work someday. Well, someday came, actually, in 2004, I think, when, um, the show must have been 2005. Anyway, L.A. MOCA, Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, mounted this huge minimal show called A Minimal Future. And by this time, things had changed so that, you know, there weren't many curators who were going to do a show with no women, or, you know, only two or three women in it when there were like 40 or 50 artists. There's still some, but not too many. So, you know, they suddenly found some of the women artists who had been doing minimal work, and they called me up and asked, told me they wanted to recreate Rainbow Picket. Well, imagine my delight when Rainbow Picket, I go to the opening, and there's a 50-foot banner in front of the museum featuring Rainbow Picket, and Rainbow Picket became sort of the signature piece for the whole show. So you never know what's going to happen if you live long enough. <laughs> okay, who else has a question? I, I wonder, um, maybe, um, it might save a little time if people would come um, up here and maybe form a line, and then I can just pass over, and I don't run around, uh, <laughs> pass this over and then pass it over again to Ms. Chicago. So could we do that? Uh, people questioning if you'd come up to the front over here, and then I'll just pass over the microphone to you. Come on, Grand Rapids, you got any questions for me? I can't believe it. You don't want to know what I thought about the contest last year? <laughs> My name is Charity Dijon Fisher. I'm from Davenport University. Um, now that you mentioned our prize, are you going to enter this year? <laughs> that wasn't my original question, but no. Actually, I was asked that at dinner. I actually never thought of it. You know, I have not entered a con sort of an art contest since I was 21, so I never really thought of it. But I mean, when the reporter interviewed me, you know. Uh, she asked if I'd heard of it, which of course I had. I'd read about it, I thought it was really interesting. What I was interested in was whether or not people in the community really became engaged, which was what its purpose is, right? So what do you think? Is that what happened? I mean, I think the idea of artists competing against each other is not the greatest idea, on, because artists are competitive enough. But on the other hand, what I think is really great is the idea that you all get a voice. And, you know, because in a way, that was what the dinner party controversy was all about. The museum world tried to shut it out. People went, we want to see it. And they organized, they started their own organizations. The Boston Center for the Arts grew out of, the, it got, the whole area got gentrified. It's the same thing in Chicago. In other words, it was an early forerunner of the idea that people have a right to have a voice in what they think about art. Do you have another question? Your real question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. I was just curious if you find that you're able to, to get your feelings across more through sculpture or through like two-dimensional, or if that's more because of you know, evolving as an artist. And I think as you saw, I've gone back and forth between two and three dimension. Actually, I myself think that the work I, I, I think is the best in my career is the work that combines, it goes, that crosses painting and sculpture. And so it's interesting that I've come back to that. And I'm happy with it. Yeah. Who are you? Hi, um, I'm Bethany Carvo. I'm actually from Case Western Reserve University, so I drove back a long way. Um, I just wanted to know what you think about the fact that you are now in the history books, um, considering that when you went to the first class, uh, women's, or your last class, the professor said women didn't do anything, but now people learn about you from art history survey classes. What do you think about that? 
I think it's great, honestly. Um, my mom's here tonight, and she saw um, the dinner party at your first opening in 1979, and I was uh, just got to go to New York for the first time three weeks ago and see it in the Brooklyn Museum, so it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> well, you know, that's why I did it, so that you could see it. <laughs> And how I feel about it, I feel, I hope that the dinner party will be one step towards overcoming the cycle of erasure that made me not know about all those women. And now you can know. Who are you? <laughs> I'm Stephanie, and I'm a senior from Hope. Um, and I'm very new to the art and our history world, so you have to work with me. But in my art history class, we, um, we're learning about the, how the, in history there used to be this distinction between art and craft, and how women um, would use certain mediums, and then that, those mediums became like, less respected. And I noticed they used a lot of needlework, and just wondering like, if you had ever experienced that, or if you had more thoughts on the topic. Well, yeah, I've had a lot of thoughts on that topic because, you know, one of, the, because I had the same attitudes. I mean, I, you know, I went to art school and, you know, I, China painting, I mean, you know, that's what old ladies do now that I'm an old lady, right? And they do do it. Huh? Anyway, <laughs> but the thing is, is, is that, you know, I accepted those distinctions because I didn't really understand how much they had to do with gender. That if men did it, it was art, and if women did it, it was craft. And in fact, there's a really fabulous new book by an, uh, a writer named Elisa Author, A-U-T-H-E-R. I never get it right, it's like, fight, it's like felt string thread or something like that. We're actually bringing her to speak in New Mexico. It's a fascinating book about the history of the relationship between art and craft. So like there's um, a reproduction of this absolutely gorgeous piece by a fiber artist named Claire Zeisler. And then there's a very clunky piece in felt by a very famous artist named Robert Morris. And his work is considered art, and her work is considered craft. But if anybody in their right mind looked at it, or if you got to vote on it, her piece is so much better. But the categories have actually shaped our perception. That's the problem. And it's really hard to unbend that. But one of my goals has been to call a lot of that into question. That's why I said thread could be like a brush stroke. Any more? OK, then I guess we'll go to the reception. And, and just before the reception, we wanted to um, thank you for coming to Grand Rapids. And the West Michigan Women's Studies Council um, hopes you will accept this small token of our appreciation. And it is uh, a pin that was created by a local woman artist. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.